So hi, everybody, for joining me with the brilliantly talented and super smart and a little intimidated Mehreen Murtaza, who um, I really enjoyed getting to know over the years. And I remember I first met, I mean, not this is relevant, but I first met Mehreen many years ago in London at an art fair. And Mehreen Murtaza is an interdisciplinary so yes, interdisciplinary artist who is currently immersed in an ongoing research on the role of imagination in the creative process. She co-founded mm. Mantic of the Mantis, a creative space, which I've been lucky enough to go to, a creative space, a library, and a publication house in Lahore with her partner, Sabine Jamil. Marion's creative process has involved an investigation of concepts such as image or object of imagination, mm -hmm. and ultimately to the actual underlying reality of all the imaginal, not imaginary objects of our perception in virtually all forms and domains. And Marion's going to talk a lot more about this. And I'm excited about her speaking about the recent project she's worked upon. Her bio is extremely um, extensive and extremely um, what's the word, admirable. And her works have been exhibited. No, it's, it's true. Her mm -hmm. works have been exhibited at prestigious venues within Pakistan and internationally, including the third and the fifth Moscow International Biennale. Uh, I cannot pronounce some of these. Les HT Miles or Mademoiselles? It's HTML. Uh, so oh. it's Les, L E S, like French. And it's yes. to do with like the web and like our interactivity with the web. These are also oh. very, very, I'm just going to interject here a little bit. Yes. Um, because also like with exhibitions, like I think it's, I mean, it's nice to have all of those listed just in order to see the kind of trajectory of works. And I'm, I've especially like enjoyed shows which have had obviously more interesting curatorial premises. And I've done all kinds of shows. And um, so I guess I'm at this point now where for me, like that bio, like usually when people ask for an artist bio, I tend to give that as like the last obligatory kind of bio, which is very factual. Um, I prefer talking more about like where my headspace is at, like my mental space, and because that can help me sort of anchor where I am right now in my practice, and people can relate to what I'm thinking and which perspectives I'm thinking in. So it's well, usually very abstract and obtuse, and sometimes people can't even gather that I'm an artist. So I had to include the term what kind of an artist is also another issue, like how does one talk about being an artist in today's time, because we have like these um, romantic notions of what uh, an artist was, how he or she is and how they exist within the contemporary art world right now. So I really debated over this because a lot of artists choose to kind of talk about themselves in terms of the discipline. I mean, artist automatically implies that you know art. Um, but I mean, within that, like all of these fields and genres have created a lot of like um, confusion, I think. So mm -hmm. I think for me, like I kind of arrived at this point where, yes, I can say interdisciplinary, like finding a space, a liminal space between varied disciplines, including art. But also I mentioned, like, I also played with words like inner or indisciplinary, like not having a discipline or knowing a discipline and then deconstructing or breaking that discipline apart. Um, so, I mean, I'm always playing with those words and those ideas uh, of what one could possibly gauge from what kind of a practice I have. So I, I tend to, these days, I'm calling it an indisciplinary, inter, interdisciplinary practice. <laughs> well, good. That is the term we will go along with then. And that sounds yeah. great. Wait, should, should I sum up a little quickly? I'll just say a few things. Sure. Okay. And she's continued to exhibit. I will continue on with these very exciting accolades. Um, the Asian Women's Film Festival, Studio Museum in Harlem, the second transnational pavilion at the 55th Venice Biennale, uh, Kunstal mm -hmm. Guangzhou, the Guangzhou Biennale, Korea, and lots of other venues. And recent exhibitions include In the Open or in Stealth, The Unruly Presence of an Intimate Future, curated by the Rux Media Collective at uh, the Musée mm -hmm. d'Art Contemporane in Barcelona, and How Will You mm -hmm. Conduct Yourself in the Company of Trees, which was at the first edition of the Lahore Biennale, by the Lahore Biennale Foundation in Lahore and Mehreen Murtaza new, at the New North uh, as part of the New North and New South at the Manchester Art Gallery in 2018. So we are very, very excited to have Mehreen here today and Thank I you. thought we could well let's start with actually I mean you know what you were talking about um, being an inner disciplinary artist what motivates mm -hmm. you what keeps you exploring what keeps you moving forward and what keeps you constantly perhaps redefining yourself and how you mm -hmm. see your practice yeah, that's a it's a difficult question but i think I know, like it's the most, a broad sorry 
we can cut and no i think it's a, i think it's pretty specific um, i think it's an essential question to ask every young artist or anyone who is in a practice and you keep reevaluating where you are in your practice and your relationship to it so when i say inner disciplinary it's also about like a discipline of something that we're experiencing on a daily life like what's the inner work by inner work i mean like what how is the process of individuation of like me growing as a person outside of the role of an artist like how is that feeding into my work and what is that conversation or dialogue that i keep engaged in which fuels my art practice hmm. um so i would say my motivation is really like what's happening inside my head um what's happening what are the external situations that are forcing me to create if i feel the need to create or if i feel the need to constantly be in a state of just like inner thought like what is happening around me and how am i gathering that information until it kind of like it keeps cooking in my mind and then it arrives at a point where i feel like okay now like there's some making that's required of some sort um and usually my practice is involved a lot of writing and reading and researching and by research i also want to clarify like it's not necessarily academic research but yes i'll read and i'll access art historical texts or publications but mostly my a lot of my resources have come from outside of the art historical narratives um but what's happening right now like i can talk about where i am right now is Please. that uh, i mean there's two major things that i'm currently really immersed in and they're kind of adding to how i am viewing my own practice from a very different vantage point uh, almost like a student although i'm in the role of a teacher um which keeps me on my toes um although i'm not teaching on a regular basis not every day so it's more of something that's optional but it keeps me preoccupied in my thoughts of how i'm relating to other students um of what their practices are and how is that challenging me as an independent artist who is working as well um mm-hmm. so i mean i try to be careful about the hierarchy of the kind of relationship i have with students because it is a kind of implicit collaboration because i'm also feeding off of what they're learning where they're at or if there is some kind of knowledge which i have acquired and, and and then i figure out how do i express it because i think for many artists the re- the issue really comes in when you're communicating or expressing the language and the skill that you use to express that idea mm-hmm. um and that's something that in tandem with mantik of the mantis which is a creative space that sabine and i were created really out of our homes um so you could call it like it's it's a library that enters into our minds kind of it's mm-hmm. like the rap rap that is happening inside of us and what we're reading what our interests are um what kind of films do we watch um so all of our own hobbies or interests we sort of decided to open them up kind of like mm. an open studio kind of mm-hmm. um so by open studio we also mean that it's not necessarily us working like sitting and crafting things but really just being in conversation so mm-hmm. if there's like a bunch of us sitting having a conversation maybe somebody's reading somebody can enter it and be part of that space um and incidentally a lot of people who have been a part or have joined mantik um have kind of become extensions of ourselves as well and a lot of them have been non artists which i think was really enriching and refreshing for me um mantik is i think mantik has it's been about 5 6 years now since we started work and it it is um it is a physical space for me it is also very much a mental or a psychic space yeah. um because people sort of enter that space and we all try to kind of be on the same wavelength and kind of learn to feed off of each other kind of like what are our shared interests our shared knowledge bases and then to really talk about the creative process and for each mm-hmm. individual what is the creative process i mean these seem like really basic fundamental questions that you know artists already kind of take for granted on some level but i think that um that it it helps keep you on your toes like you're constantly refreshing and reevaluating those ideas especially based yeah. on how other people conduct those processes um so it's been really nice to talk about all of those things and connect to other people and so in a way like connecting to another person is also seeing another facet of yourself no um, definitely so for me like, sorry i said no definitely yeah yeah so i mean so i mean it became like sort of like a communal practice where i became really comfortable in being the space where people kind of come and activate that space and then sabine and i are kind of left in conversation for days months and we bring back those same questions um and then so now what's happened is that over the past couple of years we've tried to gather as much material from our conversations or our workshops or our reading groups and use that in the form of a publication so they're not necessarily academic journals but it's also like looking at how do we transcribe how do we sort of um accumulate or accrue this knowledge and make it available for people 
And in that process, like ideas of craft and making things by your own hand, um, a relationship with paper, of binding, of thread, and in the history of publishing and the and what the status of publishing, especially when it comes to art. Um, although we're not focusing on just art, there's literature, there's there's personal uh, biographies, there's all kinds of stuff. We're really we're looking for like something that's not really mainstream or something that a commercial um, publishing house might not take on. And we find some potential in it. So we kind of work on it together as though it were an art project. So it's almost so like curating an exhibition, kind of. Like a little bit like an alternative space almost, an uh, yeah. alternative space, an alternative publishing house and alternative histories in that sense. You're preserving yeah. Yeah. them and you're um, sort of opening them up to the public. So you're doing a twofold mm -hmm. task, which is really important. Mm -hmm. And tell me, so this current moment, so then not only are you, I mean, I'm sure they're all quite intertwined, but you're focusing on your artistic practice as well as Mantek, which is in its own, like a huge project, as well mm -hmm. as the collaboration with students to some extent as you teach. That's quite a lot going on. Yeah, there is a lot. I mean, we took a little bit of a break because of Corona, like the pandemic meant that because we were having daily activities, there were film screenings, conversations yeah. after. So the program was such that I was in touch with friends and friends of friends and people from all over the world. And we were trying to make like these very heavily curated film screening programs. And those in turn led to other people who maybe somebody is visiting and they become a part and added that conversation. And then the reading group would be somehow in connection with that. So, I mean, the entire program, although appears to be very organic, um, there was some kind of a mental connection that we were making, sort of like using it as a space to kind of gather whatever we can to streamline our own personal research. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, it really took out and dreamed us of a lot of energy because um, we also kind of learned a lot about interpersonal boundaries, I think, because we open it up in our own home. And so, so that was really interesting. I think we were kind of experimenting on ourselves on some level as well. Um, and kind of taking all our ideals and putting them out there and just kind of experimenting and seeing what works and what doesn't. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think we reached we right at a point where instead of a formal structure of programming, which on some level is structured, but at the end of it, I realized that it isn't a two person's job. Like we are functioning like an organization. Um, and although we've had like memberships and we, it's like a, it's like a club or like a library membership and people join in and they can participate and find their space and figure out what they'd like to do to be part of Mantik or make it more interesting for others and open it up as an active space or how to activate it for other people. Um, so we tried everything under the sun, which we thought could work. And we were also trying to feel out what kind of people want to come hang out, um, who wants to stick around? What can we cater to them? Then we were also thinking of things like funding. And so I kind of found myself shifting roles a lot, like from managing, administrative, curating, um, to being an artist himself and sitting one day and being completely exhausted and thinking, okay, like how am I gaining from this creatively as well? So it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride. So so I think yeah, the last I can couple see of that. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a nice, refreshing break, to be honest. Um, so we were kind of really quiet in the sense that we went back in with whatever material we had and we started actually working on some of the publications that were on hold. Mm. Um, so you had time to regroup. Yeah, yeah. So and I realized that's her strength and that's really like the basis of what Mantik initially started off is like find ways yes. of compacting and gathering it and to take that time out to recuperate and come up with something that feels wholesome and right in many ways. Um, and you I mean, there's a lot the, sorry, go ahead. No, I was saying you were talking a little bit, I mean, uh, with the, that you and Sabine would kind of focus on your own personal research. And I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about what that was and what it entailed. Mm -hmm. Like in, mm -hmm. even in the sort of overarching um, project of Mantik, what were the little t finer tuned points that you were personally interested in as an artist? What were mm -hmm. you kind of looking at? Into. Well, we started um, with a very broad umbrella term yeah. of the creative process, which led to our kind of understanding what is the imagination and what role mm. does imagination play in that. Um, and from that, we kind of branched off into many, many categories like mm -hmm. metaphysics, um, maybe even like spiritual hermeneutics, um, also like creative processes of poets, of writers mm -hmm. and of artists in the same deal. And, and I mean, we've ended up with like um, very esoteric texts as well, um, a lot of theological texts. And at the moment, I would say we're like really focusing on a lot of Islamic philosophy, 
Um, and the le- last publication that came out of it was, uh, it's called Nut. Um, okay. And that's something that Sabine edited, compiled, and after a lot of like reading and writing and compiling, she it's kind of like a lifelong work in some ways. So she's been able to compile that. And this was in tandem in parallel to us having a reading group uh, where we were studying the philosophy of illumination. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that, um, we, we were kind of trying to understand different ways that many, um, I, I don't want to use the term Sufi, um, but I would say a lot of Islamic medieval medieval philosophers were looking at these ideas of how to access knowledge and gain knowledge and what are the means through which one can acquire knowledge that is outside of us, like outside of our consciousness and how to integrate it and what is the role of expressing that. Um, so for me, that's something I have been personally interested in, I think, since 2009. Mm-hmm. And I think now uh, I gave it that time to kind of settle in and now be able to say that I've kind of purged whatever I needed to, like make the kind of works that I wanted to, to arrive at a point where I can reevaluate what the image means. Um, and the image as a psychic image, how are we producing those as artists? And I mean, also like the, like the idea of the image is also something that's really heavily conceptualized in the cause of photography and the advent of photography. So I'm very clear now that this is very different from the interpretive image. And this is the image as it is that is received, and it's how we experience images in our everyday life as well. Um, so, for example, I'm teaching, um, and I often tell the students instead of going into like such dense theoretical details, um, I try to talk about sculpture as a third dimension. But I also mm-hmm. remind them that three dimension is an illusion um, because it is what our mind kind of like cognitively creates that sense, and it's something that we're conditioned into believing. So I personally believe that everything that we're experiencing is like a flat surface. Hmm. Like the flat in our everyday reality is something that the artist can see beyond and penetrate it and understand the depth that can be accessed through the image, which means that you need to be careful of not to analyze or overinterpret the image. And that process requires a certain kind of inner discipline, which is mm-hmm. where my idea of interdisciplinarity comes in. And it really depends on whoever's practices, what and what rituals they need to be able to access those inner images. Um, so I would, I mean, relate it to somewhat what depth psychology is and um, maybe just to like drop an idea of what it is. Um, it's, it's an idea that comes from the collective unconscious, which is the term coined by Carl Gustav Jung. And then there are many other contemporaries of Jung who kind of furthered his research from the collective unconscious, creating between signs and symbols that we've Uh, inherited from our spiritual ancestors um, to uncover and deconstruct what they mean for us in every age and every civilization and why they have traveled down to us and why are those same images repeated and then to also understand the source of these images which I believe is otherworldly like it's something that is coming as I mean it is coming in the form of an epiphany for many people it comes through a long drawn process of which is where the disciplinarity of an artist or a writer or a poet comes, where you're constantly engaged in that conversation or that resistance with an idea, something that's too abstract for you to completely grasp. And so the more you wrestle with it, the more it clarifies. And sometimes there are moments when it's very clear. And so for me, like recently, like I think uh, I've been able to develop and find a very different language from how I've normally worked. Um, and so as you've seen my portfolio, and I guess for all of those who are familiar with my practice and for those who aren't, um, people often ask me about like the medium that I use. And for me, I think that's always been something that's dictated by what it is that I am trying to express. So I have worked in varied mediums. Um, so considering the last works have been a lot about sound, um, especially how will you conduct yourself in the company of trees, which had a lot to do with I mean, sound became the medium to talk about something that is in some ways intangible. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't say acceptable. It's something that's very palpable and exists and you somehow just have to create some kind of a skeleton or a structure or a framework for people to identify that there is something out there that the artist is trying to express that isn't completely fixed in an image or an object or and even with installations or with large scale works or even with biennales and I mean looking at a lot of art over the last couple of years especially like I find myself more and more kind of going further and further in retrograde like going Mm -hmm. back to like the renaissance period the Mughal period to the abstract expressionists to the abstract painters and how that kind of a language still exists for many artists and how they struggle to work with that um 
So I've been kind of really interested in like changing um, the way I'm experiencing uh, my own personal reality, how to express that uh, in a way that may be um, that may be easy for people to understand. And I think in that way, How Will You Conduct Yourself was the most successful project um, because it was something that that it okay. kind of like translates like the art world or like the art going audience, which always feels alienated when there's too much heavy jargon or if it's existing within the confines of a certain structure, which other people feel like, okay, we don't fit into a gallery space for some reason. Um, so I liked it because we, because the last iteration of that project happened in Lahore mm-hmm. um, at the Lawrence Barnes, at Bagajina, at a very public space with all kinds of people. And so the kind of responses I got for that work really fueled, um, but also gave me like a huge block in some ways. And by block, I don't mean like, um, it wasn't necessarily a creative block, but it forced me to pause, I think. Um, Because that work kind of accumulated or I tried different versions of it over the last couple of years. So its first version happened in 2015 in Wiesbaden when I got a scholarship. Um, And I did it in collaboration with a number of people. Then the show traveled um, to Munster uh, and and I think, sorry, to Munich. And over there, like I had a great curator, like Lena um, was amazing because she kind of took on the project as her own artistic project. And because I couldn't be physically there, I kind of gave her free Mm -hmm. reign to kind of interpret what she wanted it to. Um, So that was also nice to see like that element of trust and yeah. having someone else completely understand the work in a way that they can make it their own. And, but and from know. there, hmm. sure, go on. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I don't want to interrupt you, but I want to ask you something after this, but go on. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say like the last iteration was the most successful because it kind mm. of transcended all of these ideas uh, that I was resisting of like mm. working within the gallery structure of object-based practices um, and really, do we need more objects in the world? And what does, like, I mean, I was really kind of like questioning really, really basic questions about the process of making things. And so for me, like, I think that pause or that break was really helpful because Mantik also fueled that. Hmm. Um, I think just talking a lot about like and hearing other people really helped me understand um, that, okay, I have a very personal practice as well. And like what I choose to share is also very, very different. On. You were asking a question. I was going to ask, now you spoke when you were talking about this project and it being the best iteration, you said that it was very mm-hmm. successful for other people also to understand. But in your mind, what has been perhaps the most, the project that has most closely translated your thought process into mm-hmm. an artwork, regardless of how other people felt about it? One that maybe it's something that you're working on right now that hasn't even come out into play yet, but something where the clarity of your thoughts and where your research, personal research is heading, how has Mm -hmm. that translated most clearly into the artwork in your mind? It doesn't matter how the gallery responds or the art fairs respond or collectors respond or the public responds. For you, Mm -hmm. what has been the best sort of an easiest transition? That's a difficult question because uh, I made a lot of work in the Mm. last couple of years and then I took a break from making. So during the process of making, I was almost working intuitively, unconsciously and producing a lot. And in that moment, I kind of went by my gut instincts. And of course, there was some kind of theoretical framework that it was revolving around. Mm -hmm. And each time in those years, I revisited the work, I always found something else. So the works were always in conversation with each other. So I was always satisfied on some level. Yeah. But to say that I mean, like a work has now come to a resolution, hmm. um, it's strange like right now in the position that I'm in and I look at my previous works, I feel like every work is in some way resolved um, because I am now understanding other aspects of what was happening in the work and I might not exactly. have been aware of what was happening at that time. Um, so it's kind of comforting <laughs> and also nice to know that because, I mean, you're always engaged in this kind of exercise of self-doubt or kind of being very, very critical of your work. And mm-hmm. and it's nice to let the work have a life of its own and let it speak to you and then let that feed into whatever has to come next. Um, so when I do say that now my language is changing, I think it also has a lot to do naturally because as you mature and as you keep showing and making work, um, your ideas about making art and about being an artist constantly change as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel a lot more settled in now and really comfortable with whatever is happening around me and what I'm doing right now. Um, 
So it has been really, really intensive work um, personally and with what, and I've always tried in some form or the other to keep myself connected to the process of making work, mm-hmm. whether that be through um, research, through just doing like simple craft making um, or just teaching even. So I think that necessity of just staying connected to the process of creating has been really, really important and just meeting other creative beings. Um, I think it's really important for me to be in conversation with other artists uh, or writers or anybody who I find is like liberated creatively. Um, and for me, like the the two people that I've been in the most conversation with, I think in these last couple of years, um, has one been Sabine, who you've met at Mantik and we're running this space together. Um, and there's also a teacher of mine and now a very close friend, uh, Mirella Radulescu, who also taught me when I was a student. Um, so, I mean, they really helped me kind of shape my ideas um, and also sort of like helped me understand a lot of things that seemed very, very abstract at the time or I wasn't aware of them. So a lot mm-hmm. has kind of changed for me. So a lot of my own ideas about art have either become stronger or they have been reevaluated now. Um, but it's nice to be in this space right now, I think. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a great space to be when you can also look back and think, okay, like I was getting somewhere with that work and mm-hmm. I hit the point that I was looking for. I just may not have realized it right back then. Yeah. yeah. So to look yeah. at things retrospectively. And tell me a little bit more about um, the show, the piece that was included in the Lahore Biennale and one that also, I believe, went to the Manchester Art Gallery. Can you tell me mm-hmm. a little bit more about maybe the more technical aspects of it and the sort of the methodology that you use. I think that would be really fascinating because when you, when you step into it as a viewer, from what I remember, it's like stepping into a beautiful silent garden and then slowly you start listening to these sounds that are like sort of all around you and emanating. And Mm. it's almost a magical feeling. You feel a little bit like you're in Neverland, you know, it like the, the Peter Pan Neverland. I, I, I felt like that anyway. It's very nice, yeah, you know. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I'd love to hear from you a little bit about the process behind creating those secret conversations that the viewer can barely hear, but not quite. Mm-hmm. That's a really nice way of saying it. it's a secret conversation. I really like that. Yeah. And I also, I mean, I mean, what you're feeling is what I felt when I first um, had the experience that I had, which led to the work. Um, so I worked really like in a very childlike kind of way with that. I mean, when I went in for the fellowship, it was a three month fellowship and I had absolutely no clue of what I'll be doing. Of course, I had a certain line of inquiry. And where um, was the fellowship? So this was in Wiesbaden in Germany. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a very small town um, and I was at uh, the NKV, which is a museum. It's an older museum and I was living inside the museum. Okay. Um, and the space that I was given was right next to my room. So it was a small, tiny gallery space as well. Um, it was really nice because it was like an old building which had a lot of character. It had um, wooden floorboards that would creak. Um, I had a bunk bed, so I felt like, you know, so it was really nice to, it felt like, it made me feel really small also, like really childlike. Um, and it reminded me of what it, what it is to be like a child and have that sense of wonder. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would just kind of walk out whenever I wanted to and I would go and spend time in the forest, walk around, I made special trips. And surprisingly, I didn't interact with a lot of people at that time, which I think really helped me a lot. Um, Mm. So because I was spending a lot of time in nature, um, there were moments where like there were certain experiences that I had, which I felt like I really wanted to share them with others or translate them in some form or the other. Um, So for me, like instantaneously, I was like, oh, like we have a voice and we speak and we communicate. and, And so we have this kind of invisible secret communication with nature around us. And having spent time with trees and felt like, okay, how do I share those conversations that I'm having with others? And so I would come up with like really literal ideas, like how do I make the tree speak so that everybody hears what I'm hearing? Um, And so literally that's how I thought of sound. And I was like, yes, of course. I mean, we need some kind of sound. Plants don't have uh, a sound in the sense that is an audible frequency for us. Um, So it really just with, I mean, the people or the kinds of ideas that I already had in mind were that I was already thinking of um, biotechnologies. Um, I was interested in natural material, um, but I was also coupling it with like man-made materials um, and how we're trying to mimic like processes of nature within these. And what is this correlation that exists, um, this kind of symbiotic relationship between us and nature and also this resistance that we have. 
Um, so there was a lot of like thinking that happened on a level where it became more of a peripatetic kind of a process where I was just walking and a lot of things would just come to me while I was walking or spending time slowing down. What does it mean to slow down time? Like nature is on a different temporality. We're running on a different temporality. So it was like a very, very boring routine I had. So I would come to my studio, go to my space to sleep, go out and spend a lot of time just walking around. It sounds um, idyllic, so I think by I, the way. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, I really genuinely like think back at that time. And I feel like that was such a privilege to have that kind yeah. of a space where everything is taken care of and I can just relax and just allow things to pour in and work with whatever there is. Um, although like I felt like because there was this need to create something, I mean, my, my project kept shifting and changing. Like I went from making a basic tree house because I was like, I want to live in a tree house. That is what I will make. And like, you know, like and the library in the tree house and like all these things that kind of, you know, filled out, uh, which filled up Mantik ultimately, like a lot of them were there. Like, I think that was the first seed. Um, and that was happening at Mantik. Um, so I mean, like, I started with the tree house and then it became a nest. And then it was this idea of like coupling with nature and how to speak to it and listen to it. So, I mean, as I was telling you before, the project is really about listening and absorbing um, a lot of energies around us, a lot of conversations around us. So I think it was more about silence and about being quiet and about being still. And, and yeah, I mean, so that's really what was the fundamental basis of the work. And so I thought, what's the most obvious way or what's the easiest way to make trees speak? And I mean, so, I mean, of course, there was some kind of scientific research. I looked into like, how do trees function? What is their ecosystem? Um, I worked with someone who was studying architecture. Um, I spoke to someone else who was working with sound art. I mean, I spoke to many, many other people. And mm -hmm. and so ultimately, the project led to many people collaborating, trying out different things, trying out like do-it-yourself technologies, finding do-it-yourself techniques, going back into history, like things like what is organ energy, for example going back to technology that World War II was using and finding okay. the most cost and most organic ways of doing what I wanted to do. So initially the project started with two um, screws put into a tree um, connected with a copper wire um, mm -hmm. and just kind of materials from it and using like an electro voltage meter and being like, and just seeing like the analog scale kind of move back and forth and getting excited that, oh wow, like this tree can speak and there is energy. They are electromagnetic waves and it becomes really real all of a sudden, like it becomes really palpable. And and so from the invisible, something visible comes through and you feel like you're getting closer to kind of materializing and realizing. So I think that was like the first Eureka moment for me and I got really excited and I had this image of, um, um, I don't know if you know about L. Ron Hubbard, but he's someone who, um, uh, he's, he's the founder of Scientology, not to say that I'm a Scientologist, but I was really fascinated by him as this character who's used like basic ideas of science and really writes science fiction stories. And and in many ways, Scientology is based on a science fiction. And I just love this idea of how immersive that fiction can be, that it can become someone else's reality. And so, I mean, I think that was a really interesting thread for the work. And so I found myself doing the same things, like checking how much a tomato, like what kind of energy would a tomato have? And like, you know, what, how much this tree has, what kind of personality does it have? And and it's sort of like, you know, like living in like an Alice in Wonderland sort of like a space and just treating everything like you're experiencing it for the first time. And then, then automatically like, people just came and went and I could collaborate with people. And, and because of the people got so excited by the project, like I had people invite me and ask to do the project again and again. Um, but each time I felt like I'm not completely satisfied with it because I ultimately I wanted to kind of kind of continue the sort of um, um, what can I say like the technological apparatus although it wasn't anything fancy I felt like I instead of concealing it because I couldn't I thought okay let's work with it like the wires become the vines they're entangled around the trees they exist and that's the apparatus is completely transparent that's how we're creating the sound and what you're hearing live is the mood or the sense of the tree in response to us. So it's like live electro biomagnetic feedback that you're getting, which is something that's happening right now between us as well. And all the people who are logged on as well. Um, that's so, I mean, there is, there is like an invisible thread or a connection that's there. And, and because we're speaking, we might not be completely aware of it. And maybe if we go silent for a while and just kind of try to sense our way through it, maybe we could access that in some ways. 
I mean, so I mean, this also kind of like I kind of also digressed into more kind of esoteric ideas, practices like such as Reiki, um, and and that really fascinated me. And then I kind of got more inclined towards different kinds of spiritual practices. Um, so I mean, all of that started feeding into what it is that I really wanted to say or do, and also to think about it as an artist. Um, and I guess the 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 last version, which was in Lahore, was really good because I had really young kids um, come up and completely get the work, and you don't really have to be there to explain what's going on, um, unless someone's really curious and they want to know like what the science behind it is. Um, but people just kind of came up to us and told us what they thought of the work and how it functioned, and and it raised a lot of questions, like really fundamental questions about our relationship. Um, with the world around us, and with other people and other beings that are very much sentient and alive. And what I loved about it also was some of the photographs that you have people just hugging trees and being at one. Yeah. And I think particularly for what's going on right now, that thought process and that way of thinking is so absolutely important. And it's something we all kind of have to go back towards thinking of. And mm -hmm. I also really liked how in a sense, the organic and the very uh, sort of alive quality of that work is also so juxtaposed with some of your previous pieces, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. though it's a similar thought process, the method, perhaps not the method of creation, but the end result and presentation was so vastly different, but you could mm. still see that connection with technology, that connection with the imagination, that connection mm. with the earth very much mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean for me they're all like entangled they're not of there's course. no divisions between them um because i mean whatever technology that we are using or creating right now is also made from organic material um so i'm and i find it sometimes very difficult to understand what do we mean by this division like why are we separating this reality from the reality that we're in it's just a shift in perception or a shift in a certain dimension maybe yeah. um because at the end of the day, like everything is organic. Um, so for me, like nothing is alien or everything is alien in some ways. Um, so it's also our relationship to matter. Like how do we choose to understand the essence of matter? And so, I mean, even like a project like um, um, like Deep Earth Object, yeah. um, that's also made out of metal. Um, it's, it's corroded iron. Um, so for me, that was really, really important also to talk about like, the importance of iron for me and what does it mean for the material to sort of go through this process of entropy and how it kind of goes back into the earth because the project was then ultimately buried um, in exactly. Dubai. Where it was. Um, so, I mean, maybe I can talk a bit more about this, but there is this person, um, Talha Bahadur Ali, who I was just noticed that he's messaged and he's asking for a translation in Urdu. Um, so I just want to say that we're speaking in English because we have people from all across the world and English seems to be the easiest language that we can use to discuss the works. Um, and the project that I was talking about, How Will You Conduct Yourself in the Company of Trees, was shown in various places, um, not in America. Um, it was shown in uh, mostly in Europe and the last version of it was shown in Lahore. Um, and so Deep Earth Object, which I'm talking about, is um, it's something that... Um, Actually, there were two versions of it. One, the, the first version was called Deep Sky Object, and the next version was called Deep Earth Object. Um, so this was really initiated by my interest in, um, again, coming from science fiction as a trope, like this idea or this fantasy that we have of US, UFOs and aliens and NASA had started recording um, a lot of space junk. Uh, which is polluting okay. our airspace and a lot of that space junk is just like stuff that is residue from a lot of space shuttles and satellites and there were parts of it that were falling across the globe and because they go through certain intense kind of processes uh, of heat and cooling down and going through all of the different stratospheres to arrive on earth they completely transform they become kind of like these morphogenic kind of objects mm -hmm. which people thought were like ufos at some point so again, like that fiction around them was really, really interesting for me. And 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 also then you find so many um, examples of this kind of orb-like structure of like the, of almost like a, of almost like the shape of the globe, of the earth, of planets, of the spheres. Um, but also the fact that how uh, moving through space, um, an angular object kind of completely became rounded in some ways. Um, so the shape itself was really, really interesting for me. And 
So how the space probe sort of entered from the skies, unknown to us, enters and reaches us in this sort of ahistorical fashion. Like it kind of transcends history in some ways and only, the only clues to its context can be its material. Um, so deep sky object was this huge massive sphere um, which had a small opening and you could kind of like put your head inside the opening and there were speakers installed inside to create like this sense of resonance or reverberation and there was a sound playing inside. Um, so the sound was more like a who. Um, so that sound um, kind of like moves inside of it and as you move your head out, you can no longer hear that sound. Um, so also that relationship with us, with that large structure um, and how we kind of experience that object was really, really important for me. Um, and then the next version I was asked to commission uh, I was commissioned for a project by Al Sarkal in Dubai. And um, so I thought of like a different version of it again. And I imagined like, oh, like what if there are like different versions of this space probe or object that kind of plonks in different parts of the world and I can start creating like this fiction and this story about this extraterrestrial object. Um, so this one was, um, uh, I worked with it in such a way that it wasn't a whole sphere. It was quadrants of the sphere. Um, and, and I sort of worked in a counterintuitive way where we actually fabricated and constructed the sphere in steel. Um, and then with those, uh, and the iron girders and like the armature inside was also completely made of metal. Um, so we just kind of worked backwards in time and we tried to make it look like it had rusticated over time. Um, so in that process, I started learning a lot about the qualities of iron and how it exists within us. It's an essential part. You find iron ore deposits. How does nature interact with iron? So it, it made sense for me for that project to go back into the earth. Um, and also Dubai was important as a space where the object is in conversation with um, Dubai itself um, as this completely fabricated, um, constructed, almost plastic space that where you can't see the landscape anymore. The actual landscape is completely concealed. And in some ways, Dubai is like um, the antithesis of what that terrain or topography is. It's almost exactly. like they're trying to hide it from what it is. Um, so I felt like, okay, so here's this object that peers back to you um, and looks back at you as to what it is. So th those same structures will eventually rusticate, will Almost like get kind of... Almost like the underbelly is what you were showing in a sense, like the underbelly of the maybe. earth. Using the underbelly of the earth, maybe, yes. Like, um, I don't know about the underbelly of the bay, well, but no, yeah. Maybe not, but you know, using the very elemental metallics or materials within us mm. and mm. sort of human senses and creating mm -hmm. something based off of that conversation. Mm. That's really quite interesting. Like even looking at how human senses interact with the elements swirling within each of us, which we aren't even aware about, and the sort of elements swirling around us. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. I mean, like, I think also our relationship with um, what we call organic material. Like, I yes. mean, each That's material a has a different characteristic or a different personality. Um, I mean, a lot of people's again, uh, a lot of people again separate certain kinds of metals, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm excluding alloys alloys here because those are like you know two different kinds of metals that come into conversation with each with each other to create something new. Um, so I'm talking about something that is in its purest form, and what kind of values does it have? What kind of healing powers does it have? Um, how does it exist in our bodies? How do we consume it? Um, so we're we are part those elements are already a part of us in many ways. Um, so I don't see like a distancing of any sort. And so maybe like these series of works are really about, in a very roundabout elliptical way, um, talking about coming back to oneself. Um, so it might have required like this whole stage and this whole drama or this whole sci-fi story um, about the speaking plants and about these objects that come from out of space and they enter and they're trying to show us something or they're trying to trigger something in our imagination. Um, so the object is not really um, of necessarily focus for me, but it is what kind of a story does the object create? And and I think with the with the plants project, it was interesting because there was like a pair of kids who came up to me and said, oh, so since you're the artist, did you make the tree? And, oh, and so that was... So that was a really important question for me to consider, like what is the role of the artist? and and what is it exactly that are we constructing or creating or sharing or expressing? 
and and I think so much art is just trying to kind of capture that kind of fleeting experience or an essence of what it is, and that's why it's so difficult to talk about it, or it's it can be so indescribable at times. And no matter how much you write about it or think about it, and that's why there is this need to constantly keep creating. Um, so I really, really enjoyed those instances, and I, in some ways, wanted to reproduce those experiences. Um, and each time, of course, in the effort to mimic my own experience, I would end up creating a new experience. And then when people enter that space, something else is created, which is completely out of your hands. Um, so that autonomy and that relationship of your work with yourself is also sometimes really difficult. Um, it's almost like you gave birth to something and now you've kind of let it go and you can't really control what that object um, does or says about you. Especially since it adapts to everybody who's interacting with it. I think that's what's also so fascinating about your work, that it's mm -hmm. not stagnant in any way. It's constantly mm -hmm. evolving and responding to stimuli mm -hmm. around it and stimuli in the form mm -hmm. of individuals who've come into this space mm -hmm. or, you know, peered mm -hmm. into the hole or whatever, not hole, sorry, but mm -hmm. peered into the sculpture or stepped mm -hmm. into the, the tree space. That's mm -hmm. really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So even mm -hmm. more so than other artists, in a sense, you really have to be like, okay, well, now it has its, um, a life of its own, an organic life of its own. Yeah. And I think I really felt that when uh, Mantik also opened up as a space because of Mantik course, is a living, living organism in many more ways than I could imagine. And it's becoming bigger or smaller or shrinking. And, you know, it's like a crazy kind of like it has a life of its own. It's very exactly. independent. Um, so it might also be this like it kind of like finds its way to be what it is. And so it's still something that's kind of like, we're still trying to figure it out as we go along. So that's also a very organic process. And I think it's a much more slower process because it's it's also something that we live in, that we are and is an extension of us, but it is also not an extension of us. And what's nice about it is that it's not just an exhibition, like you make the object, it travels, and sometimes you're not even there with it. Um, so this has been a very different experience. And I think this shift for me was, really interesting because it's like living in the artwork because a lot of the times you create the work and you get to spend a certain amount of time with the process. Um, but with actually experiencing the work, like you have somehow, I have had very little experience except for when it was in the studio, in my mind, in the laptop, as a print, as an image or as an object. Um, so this becomes a very, very different space and to be working in. Becomes, yeah, into an entire life in a sense. Yeah, because yeah. all aspects of it. And I know that you, you had told me that this that the installation itself also traveled. So while you still had Mantik oh, in yeah, the core yeah, and the way yeah. that you were moving with it, the installation of Mantik went to different mm -hmm. places. Okay, so this was also a bit of a conundrum for us. Like, Acha, yeah. so it was also us questioning, what is Mantik exactly, exactly if it is to travel? Um, so there were these one or two experiments that we did. I mean, so the first experiment, um, was really for a find a way for it to exist and be in essence the same space as it is here with us in it, which is also creating that energy or vibration of that space, which gives it that warmth perhaps or makes it open for people to kind of enter um, into an active conversation. Um, so is it enough to create it physically and expect that people will feel the same way when they enter it? Um, so is it the objects that are doing that? Is it the books that are doing that? And how long does the space have to exist for it to be lived in? Um, so there were a lot of these questions of like the temporality of the space, which um, were challenging for me in this sense. Um, and because I was looking at Mantik entirely at that time, um, and when I was asked to do this particular show, it was part of a, again, it was part of a workshop, um, which was uh, with an organization called Out of the Circle. Okay. Um, and then there is a space in Leipzig, which uh, um, um, which decided to host the, the workshop participants and they had many other local artists. So I got a chance to meet artists from all over the world and, and that experience was uh, primarily focused on artists who are in some way interested in the identity of Islam, um, yeah. either as a religion or as a choice um, of living as a Muslim and our relationship to the Muslim world on a political level as well, on a social and a cultural level as well. Um, so I thought since there was a lot of dialogue, Mantik is a space where there is a lot of conversation and I wanted to kind of carry that idea over there. 
And a lot of the conversations that we were having in Cairo were really similar to what we were having over here in, in Lahore. So it, the idea was to kind of how do we connect these two spaces which are so geographically apart, but yet mm-hmm. the content is similar. So how do we bridge that gap? And so we kind of, I kind of tried to like mix. It was a kind of like a mix, but that meant also that I had to revisit older works and kind of reconfigure them in a way where I was kind of making this constellation of ideas in my head of pre-existing ideas and how do I bring them to come together in a single space, so to speak. Um, so there were like multiple bodies of works that I kind of revisited and we recreated them under Mantik in that space. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there were like some publications of mine, for example, UFO Hunters, which was part of D- Deep Earth Object, um, was really my experience of being in Dubai and creating UFO Hunters. So there was an image or two that kind of translated from that and sort of became like the centerpiece of the space. Um, so you kind of walk up these stairs and on the floor, there's a huge print of um, of like a sort of an aerial view of a cavern, of a cavity, which looks really, really organic as well. And that was kind of lifted from the publication and you blew it up and had it in the space. Um, and then there was another image that is a blown up image from a show that I did with Experimenter. Um, which was, again, like this fictitious narrative about these three mad scientists. And so I took out those characters and sort of like created like this assemblage out of my previous works. And so you kind of finally walk into the space and you enter into Mantik, um, which was created to the T, amazingly, like from the lampshade to the rugs, to the sitting area, um, to like all the weird artifacts and objects that we've been collecting from all around the world. Um, And we sent a couple of our publications and... um, just so that people kind of get a sense of what Mantik is as well. So you kind of travel through all of these realms and you arrive at the space where um, even in the exhibition scenario, people were able to come and sit down and have conversations about the show over there. That's um, how, how did you yeah. feel? But this is the last thing I'm going to ask you because then I want to open it up to questions before we run out of time. But I wanted to mm-hmm. ask, how did you feel when it was all up like that? Did you feel that Mantik had successfully been translated into this new space or did you feel that something was still missing and maybe that something was the presence of like you and Sabine living your life Mm -hmm. in that space having Mm -hmm. friends and visitors over constantly or did Mm -hmm. you feel no just the fact that it had been set up it was still a space where people had conversations it Mm -hmm. still had that same essence. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I wasn't there when the exhibition was set up, but we were in constant conversation with the curators okay. and, um, and, and Elham was great. Like, so there was Elham Khatab from, uh, from Out of the Circle. Um, and then there was uh, Michael Arts from Leipzig um, at Hall 14. And so they were in conversation. So there was one stream of conversation, which was purely technical like finding furniture that looked exactly like the kind of furniture that we were looking for. So that meant kind of like looking for stock photos, uh, going to like um, flea markets, uh, finding stuff on eBay, which kind of matched what we were looking for. So a certain time period, a certain kind of an era. Um, I mean, so there was a lot of research that was happening on that side, almost like you would prepare a film set. And on the other hand, we were having conversations about the content of the publications and how that's feeding into all of this. Um, so one of the one of the main parts of that project, uh, which the exhibition is called Forgotten Enlightenment. Um, so I kind of uh, kind of gathered. Uh, so we were commissioned and we were given like a small budget. Uh, actually, it was a very, very big budget. Um, it was a good budget because with that budget, what I did was, OK, like, how do we I mean, there was a separate budget to actually recreate that space. And then there was a separate budget allotted for where I just bought a lot of books. And so what we did was with those books that they were all related to ideas of um, Islamic medieval philosophy or anything that might correlate and be close to it. Some were in German, some were in English. Um, And the idea was that these books will then be creating and helping enhance and keep the conversation going. And we can have our reading group simultaneously over here and in Leipzig. Um, Brilliant. Wait, okay, I'm going to pause you because I'm worried that we're running over time. But does anybody have any questions for Mehreen? So if you do, and I'm sorry, I've been moving so much. I'm embarrassed to say my phone was about to die. So I had to go hunting for a charger. But please, sorry. (laughs) But please, everybody, ask your questions for Mehreen and we can get to them. But until then, please keep talking, by the way. (laughs) Do you have any questions? I've asked so many. (laughs) I mean, you may not realize it, but every time I'd like think of a question in my mind, you would sort of answer it through your conversation, which was fantastic. 
I mean, I also feel like, I mean, 40 minutes for me is it also feels really short because I feel like we've just started touching upon like some ideas. It would be nice to kind of open up and deconstruct. Um, yes. It's also well, we can always we can always do this again if you would like. I'm very open to having sure, this. Really. Happens every week, so we can just schedule another yeah. one. It'd be so fascinating to hear. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could like we could then like kind of focus on something in particular and talk about exactly. it because. And, and I, I, I mean, really have really the opportunity to kind of like share with everybody, like, oh, this is what's happening in my head, in my life, in the creative process. Um, but also to kind of like go deeper into like the creative process and talk about very specific things that one might be engaged in. And I mean, it would be nice to have a conversation since we are live on Insta. I don't know. Can we have like more than two people on Instagram? Like maybe have other artists come across to have like a cross conversation. That would be kind of fun though. I don't think we can. Um, I've been wanting to do one with Hurmat and Rabia and I, mm -hmm. we need to structure it properly because I think there is that issue that you can't have more than two people simultaneously. So it would be like 20 minutes with one then 20 minutes with the other kind of thing like back and forth. Mm -hmm. so I think actually, but that worked quite nicely. So yes, we can always do one and we bring in a third person as well and the three of us keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, for me, like, there's a lot of, like, things while I was talking that I realized, okay, there's also this, but I'll go into that later. There's also this. And I mean, you can, like, really boil down, like, certain ideas. Um, and I also just wanted to, like, say hi also to a lot of people who logged on. I missed who most of the people who were that logged on. Um, but also, like, I've also been, um, um, so I also wanted to mention, like, two people who we're currently in conversation with uh, through Mantik because we're also um, kind of part of an ongoing research residency. Um, so we're in conversation and we are developing works together, um, which at some point will materialize based on the pandemic situation, on funding. And if we can fly them over because Mantik is going to open up a residency program. Fantastic. Um, and we're starting with friends and people who we know and we would love to kind of stay in touch and actually get to meet again. Um, and this has been nice because through residencies, I've met so many amazing people. Um, and one or two of them are, one is Rohini Devishir. Um, who I, I don't know if you've heard of her, but she's um, based in India. Um, and she is an artist whose practice is, um, it's really uh, like she's more of like an amateur astronomer um, who is kind of like looking at astronomy more from a metaphorical or poetic perspective. And although her practice is very, very um, research intensive and it requires a lot of laborious hours of kind of photographing, going to observatories, gathering data, um, and then she's kind of doing a lot of live sonic installations now. And so her work is kind of also becoming much more grander as well in those ways. And there's a lot of overlapping themes and ideas um, that we've been sharing with each other. And while I was in Manchester, I met Kelly Jane Jones. Um, she's also an artist and she does a lot of performance based sonic, wow. also live installations and performances. Um, she's been interested in collaborating with other artists who kind of create organic instruments for her. Um, and she also then performs live with those instruments. And again, we have a lot of like similarities in our creative processes, our ideas, our interests. So we've been in conversation for the last couple of years um, about whatever it is that we're kind of aligned with. Um, so it's nice to kind of have a very slow process of just kind of like taking our time to absorb and accumulate things and wait until something comes out of it as opposed to like just creating for the sake of creating. Um, so there is a very different kind of momentum or sense of time uh, with my own practice also, but also with what's happening with Mantik. Um, and of course, it requires a different base and a different knowledge base and a different kind of understanding also. Um, but it's nice to go back to college because it's almost like going back to school because you're also relearning so many things or you're forced to go back and kind of refresh your own memory and then find a way to express it to someone else. Um, or there are things that you've been taking for granted and now when the time comes to kind of share it or make someone else understand it without instructing them, like just through the process of doing an exercise together. Um, that's also been really revelatory in many ways because you learn something new each time. Um, so and I've, I've, I've at the moment what I'm teaching is, although it's, it's to do with like um, sculpture, um, but it's really about like the process of looking at various aspects of making objects. Um, so the object making isn't so interesting, but our relationship with the matter and how to translate our expression through that matter and understanding um, our own like dimensional shifts, like from say, like from an 
everyday experience of being in this reality present right now with myself and at the same time simultaneously being present with you through the virtual sphere also being on the internet instagram like all these various dimensions that we are kind of interconnected with um these are all like perceptual shifts that we're experiencing and even like how we're experiencing life is a series of images like 24 frames per second a film is created and i feel like film is like really the strongest medium right now which kind of translates how our um, memory works in some ways and um, you also just explained it so clearly as well actually by even using mm-hmm. this virtual reality that we have going as well as this physical reality yeah yeah so, i mean like to I'm going to pause you because I'm afraid we're about to run out of time, and I want to thank you properly and save this before it goes like walkabout, which it does once in a while, disastrously. Mm-hmm. But thank you so much for this. Thank you for taking out the time to come on this platform. I can't tell you how much it means to me, and we'll have to have a real conversation soon. And thank you yes. everybody who logged in to listen to the fabulous Mary Murtaza and her very very interesting thoughts. No, thanks so much for inviting me. I'm glad we finally got to do it. I mean, I've been in kind of transit, and it's been difficult for us to connect, but I'm glad it actually happened now. So that's good. <laughs>